The Pilgrimage of Grace was a popular rising in Yorkshire in the autumn of 1536 against Henry VIII's break with the Roman Catholic Church. The dissolution of the monasteries and the policies of the King's chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, as well as other specific political, social and economic grievances. It has been termed the most serious of all Tudor rebellions, although sometimes used to refer to other risings in northern England at the time, including the Lincolnshire Rising twelve days before the Pilgrimage of Grace. The term technically refers only to the uprising in Yorkshire. The traditional historical view portrays it as a spontaneous mass protest of the conservative elements in the north of England angry with the religious upheavals instigated by King Henry VIII. Historians have noted that there were contributing studied economic issues. Lincolnshire Rising The Lincolnshire Rising was a brief rising by Roman Catholics against the establishment of the Church of England by Henri VIII and the dissolution of the monasteries set in motion by Thomas Cromwell. Both planned to assert the nation's religious autonomy and the king's supremacy over religious matters. The dissolution of the monasteries resulted in much property being transferred to the crown. The rising began on 2 October 1536 at St. James Church, Louth, after Evensong, shortly after the closure of Louth Park Abbey. The stated aim of the uprising was to protest the suppression of Catholic religious houses, not the rule of Henry VIII himself. It quickly gained support in Horncastle, Market Raisin, Caister and other nearby towns. Angered by the actions of commissioners, the protesters or rioters demanded the end of the collection of a subsidy, the end of the Ten Articles, an end to the dissolution, an end to taxes in peacetime, a purge of heretics in government and the repeal of the Statute of Uses. With support from local gentry, a force of demonstrators, estimated at up to 40,000, marched on Lincoln, Lincolnshire, and, by the 14th of October, occupied Lincoln Cathedral. They demanded the freedom to continue worshipping as Catholics and protection for the treasures of Lincolnshire churches. The protest was led by a monk and a shoemaker and involved 22,000 people. The moratorium effectively ended on 4 October 1536, when the king sent word for the occupiers to disperse or face the forces of Charles Brandon, 1st Duke of Suffolk, which had already been mobilized. By 14 October, few remained in Lincoln. Following the rising, the vicar of Louth and Captain Cobbler, two of the main leaders, were captured and hanged at Tyburn. Most of the other local ringleaders were also executed during the next 12 days, including William Morland, or Borrowby, one of the former Louth Park Abbey monks. A lawyer from Willingham was hanged, drawn and courted for his involvement. The Lincolnshire Rising helped inspire the more widespread Pilgrimage of Grace. Pilgrimage of Grace and the Early Tudor Crisis The movement broke out on 13 October 1536, immediately following the failure of the Lincolnshire Rising. Only then was the term Pilgrimage of Grace used. Historians have identified several key themes of the revolt. Economic The northern gentry had concerns over the new statute of uses. The poor harvest of 1535 had also led to high food prices, which likely contributed to discontent. Political Many people in northern England disliked the way in which Henry VIII had cast off his wife, Catherine of Aragon. Although her successor, Anne Boleyn, had been unpopular as Catherine's replacement, as both a rumoured Protestant and a Southerner, her execution in 1536 on trumped-up charges of adultery and treason had done much to undermine the monarchy's prestige and the king's personal reputation. Aristocrats objected to the rise of Thomas Cromwell, who was base-born. Religious The local church was, for many in the north, the centre of community life. Many ordinary peasants were worried that their church plate would be confiscated. There were also popular rumours at the time which hinted that baptisms might be taxed. The recently released Ten Articles and the new order of prayer issued by the government in 1535 had also made official doctrine more reformed, which went against the conservative beliefs of most northerners. Events 
Robert Esk was chosen to lead the insurgents, he was a barrister from London, a resident of the Inns of Court, and the younger son of Sir Robert Ask of Orton, near Selby. His family was from Ask Hall, Richmondshire, and had long been in Yorkshire. In 1536, Ask led a band of 9,000 followers, who entered and occupied York. He arranged for expelled monks and nuns to return to their houses. The king's newly installed tenants were driven out, and Catholic observances were resumed. The rising was so successful that the royalist leaders, Thomas Howard, 3rd Duke of Norfolk, and George Talbot, 4th Earl of Shrewsbury, opened negotiations with the insurgents at Scoresby Lays, near Doncaster, where Ask had assembled between 30 and 40,000 people. Norfolk promised a general pardon and a parliament to be held at York within a year, as well as a reprieve for the abbeys until the parliament had met. Naively trusting the king's promises, Ask dismissed his followers. Jesse Childs specifically notes that Henry VIII did not authorize Thomas Howard, 3rd Duke of Norfolk, to grant remedies for the grievances. Norfolk's enemies had whispered into the king's ear that the Howards could put down a rebellion of peasants if they wanted to, suggesting that Norfolk sympathized with the pilgrimage. Norfolk, seeing their vast numbers negotiated and made promises to avoid being massacred. Suppression. In February 1537 there was a new rising in Cumberland and Westmoreland, called Bigard's Rebellion, under Sir Francis Bigard, of Settrington in the North Riding of Yorkshire. Because he knew the promises he made on behalf of the king would not be met, Norfolk reacted quickly to the new uprising. He could demonstrate his virtue after the pilgrims did not disperse as they had promised. The rebellion failed and King Henry arrested Bigard, asking several other rebels, such as Darcy, John Hussey, 1st Baron Hussey of Sleaford, the chief butler of England, Sir Thomas Percy, and Sir Robert Constable. All were convicted of treason and executed. During 1537 Bigard was hanged at Tyburn, Lords Darcy and Hussey both beheaded, Thomas Moyne, MP. For Lincoln was hanged, drawn and quartered, Sir Robert Constable hanged in chains at Hull, and Robert Ask hanged in chains at York. In total 216 were executed, several lords and knights, six abbots, 38 monks, and 16 parish priests. Sir Nicholas Tempest Bow Bearer of the Forest of Boland was hanged at Tyburn, Sir John Bulmer hanged drawn and quartered and his wife Margaret Stafford burnt at the stake. In late 1538, Sir Edward Neville Keeper of the Sewer was beheaded. The loss of the leaders enabled the Duke of Norfolk to quell the rising, and martial law was imposed upon the demonstrating regions. Norfolk executed some 216 activists, churchmen, monks, commoners. The details of the trial and execution of major leaders were recorded by the author of Riardsley's Chronicle, 63-4 also the 16th day of May, 1537. There were arraigned at Westminster for the King's Commissioners, the Lord Chancellor that day being the chief, these persons following, Sir Robert Constable, Knight, Sir Thomas Percy, Knight, and brother to the Earl of Northumberland, Sir John Bulmer, Knight, and Ralph Bulmer, his son and heir, Sir Francis Bigard, Knight, Margaret Cheney, after Lady Bulmer by untrue matrimony, George Lumley, Esquire, Robert Ask, gentleman, that was captain in the insurrection of the Northern Men, and one Hamilton, Esquire, all which persons were indicted of high treason against the king and that day condemned by a jury of knights and esquires for the same, whereupon they had sentenced to be drawn, hanged and courted. But Ralph Bulmer, the son of John Bulmer, was reprieved and had no sentence. And on the 25th day of May, being the Friday in Whitsonwick, Sir John Bulmer, Sir Stephen Hamerton, knights, were hanged and headed, Nicholas Tempest, Esquire, Dr. Cockerell, Priest, Abbot Quondam of Fountains, and Dr. Pickering, Friar, were drawn from the Tower of London to Tyburn, and there hanged, bowled and courted, and their heads set on London Bridge in divers gates in London. And the same day Margaret Cheney, other wife to Balmer called, was drawn after them from the Tower of London into Smithfield. 
and there burned according to her judgment, God pardon her soul, being the Friday in Whitsonwick, she was a very fair creature, and a beautiful, failures. The Lincolnshire Rising and the Pilgrimage of Grace have traditionally been seen as complete failures. England was not reconciled to the Roman Catholic Church, except during the brief reign of Mary I. The dissolution of the monasteries continued unabated, with the largest monasteries being dissolved by 1540. Great tracts of land were seized from the church and divided among the crown and its supporters. The steps towards official Protestantism achieved by Cromwell continued except during the reign of Mary I. However, they had some successes. Successes. Their partial successes are less known. The government postponed the collection of the October subsidy, a major grievance amongst the Lincolnshire organisations. The statute of uses was partially negated by a new law, the statute of wills. Four of the seven sacraments that were omitted from the Ten Articles were restored in the Bishop's Book of 1537, which marks the end of the drift of official doctrine towards Protestantism. The Bishop's Book was followed by the Six Articles of 1539. An onslaught upon heresy was promised in a royal proclamation in 1538. Leadership. Historians have noted the leaders among the nobility and gentry in the Lincolnshire Rising and the Pilgrimage of Grace and tend to argue that the Risings gained legitimacy only through the involvement of the northern nobility and gentlemen, such as Lord Darcy, Lord Hussey and Robert Hask. However, historians such as M.E., James, C.S.L., Davies and Andy Wood, among others, believe the question of leadership was more complex. James and Davies look at the Risings of 1536 as the product of common grievances. The lower classes were aggrieved because of the closure of local monasteries by the Act of Suppression. The northern nobility felt their rights were being taken away from them in the Acts of 1535 to 1536, which made them lose confidence in the royal government. James analyzed how the lower classes and the nobility used each other as a legitimizing force in an extremely ordered society. The nobles hid behind the force of the lower classes with claims of coercion, since they were seen as blameless for their actions because they did not possess political choice. This allowed the nobles an arena to air their grievances while, at the same time, playing the victims of popular violence. The lower classes used the nobility to give their grievance a sense of obedience since the leaders of the rebellion were of a higher social class. Davies considers the leadership of the 1536 Risings as more of a cohesion. Common grievances over evil advisers and religion brought the higher and lower classes together in the fight. Once the nobles had to confront the king's forces in an all-out war, they decided to surrender, thereby ending the cohesion. Historian Andy Wood, representing social historians of the late 20th century who have found more agency among the lower classes, argues that the commons were the effective force behind the risings. He argues that this force came from a class group largely left out of history, minor gentlemen and well-off farmers. He believes these groups were the leaders of the risings because they had more political agency and thought.